Today's program is being recorded. Any views expressed in this webinar are for general educational purposes only and do not represent any official views or positions of the sponsoring or presenters organizations. Please send in your questions and answers throughout the presentation. We'll take them in the end. Greetings and welcome to today's educational program in the webinar series of preparing for process analysis. This is webinar number six. A modern approach to statistical process control by Sandy Furcher and Doug Wood. This is your moderator, Shobha Mittal with the ASQ Quality Management Division. Today we have the distinct pleasure of hearing from Sandy Furcher and Doug Wood. Please join me in welcoming them. Dr. Sandy Furcher is a professor of practice at the Ohio State University in the Department of Integrated System Engineering. She has applied Lean Six Sigma systems engineering and engineering management tools in healthcare and other service industries. She previously managed the Enterprise Performance Excellence Center in the healthcare system. Dr. Furter received her PhD in industrial engineering with a specialization in quality engineering from the University of Central Florida in 2004. She received an MBA from Xavier University and a bachelor's and a master's of science in industrial and systems engineering from the Ohio State University. She is an ASQ certified Six Sigma Black Belt, certified manager of quality, organizational excellence, certified quality engineer and an ASQ fellow and a certified Six Sigma Master Black Belt. Mr. Doug Wood has worked over 40 years in the areas of cost of quality, office waste, root cause analysis, performance measurement, he has helped others with various ASQ certifications in quality auditing, management, and engineering. He has also taught audit, Lean Six Sigma, cost of quality, statistics, and failure modes and effect analysis. He has four ASQ certifications, CQE, CQA, SSBB, and CMQOE. Doug was the 2023 recipient of the ASQ QMD Howard Jones Award given for outstanding long-term services as a vice chair of education from 2015 to 2021. Doug has three publications by ASQ Quality Press, the Certified Manager of Quality Organization Excellence Handbook, 5th edition. This is also quoted uh, by Sandy. The Executive Guide to Understanding and Implementing Quality Cost Programs, Reduce Operating Expense and Increase Revenue, and Principles of Quality Cost, Financial Measures for Strategic Implementation of Quality Management, 4th edition. His firm, DC Wood Consulting LLC, has worked with clients in manufacturing, healthcare, and transactional businesses. The company website is www.dcwoodconsulting.com. And so, Without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Sandy and Doug to you all. Doug and Sandy, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Shoba. That was really nice. Uh, so, welcome everybody from wherever you are. We're seeing people from a lot of different countries. Uh, this is great. Uh, so, we're gonna we're gonna talk about statistical process control today. And um, the, this uh, the, this talk, you know, Sandy and I developed this talk and put this material together, you know, just for you tonight. We we've not used this anywhere else, so you guys get to see it. This is the first time. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of human fallacies, and a lot of management fallacies. Uh, People will often make well-intentioned adjustments to their processes. Um, you know, they they'll they think, oh, we have to just do something. You know, we have to keep busy. Um, or any action is better than no action. Well, sometimes the actions you take make it worse. Okay. Uh, look at the question on here. Do you seek to have consistency in your processes? Do you seek predictability and do you seek reliability? And that's a rhetorical question because I think you absolutely do. Um, there are three ways to try to predict what's going to happen. You can track the averages of things. Okay. Well, that's what has happened. Uh, but, but what's a significant shift? 
Okay, you can look at the specifications and you can try to meet the specs directly. The, the problem is specifications don't always help you meet them. Sometimes uh, the specs aren't, aren't enough. Uh, what we're gonna choose here is to monitor what we call the voice of the process. That's, that's the, the, the critical thing that you're gonna need to know. You gotta run your processes, right? So SBC helps us answer the questions. Has the process changed and how should I respond? Uh, we're gonna keep the history part of this very short and we're gonna focus on fundamentals and usage. And of course, we're gonna mention some common mistakes that happen when people are applying SPC. And at the end, we, we've got our conclusions and yes, we're gonna give you some recommendations. We're gonna answer that one, Anna. So first of all, Walter Schuhart. Uh, I, I don't know if you know him. Now this, this book is sitting in ASQ headquarters in Milwaukee and I took this picture. Uh, so it was, Walter Schuhart created this. He's the father of statistical quality control because he brought together statistics, engineering and economics. And he made a very highly effective tool, the control chart. Now this technique and the principles behind it is a principal role in economic development from the 1940s to today. Just because it's old doesn't mean it's obsolete. He described the basic principles of this new discipline in his book. And, and it was the first statistics text that focused on quality from 1931. That's this book. Uh, his focus was on finding economic ways to reduce costs by identifying problems sooner in the process and reducing the cost of inspection. Perhaps some of you might, um, some, some of you might want to do that too. Okay. Uh, most of his professional career was spent at Western Electric as an engineer from 1918 to 1924. And he was at Bell Labs, Bell Telephone, you know, the phone company from 1925 until his retirement in 1956. So he gave, the profession, some of its most capable experts. He was a mentor of both Durand and Deming. So besides control charts, he also created the concept of plan, do, check, act, okay? So he did a lot. When we look at some of these steps here, what do you do in running out SBC? Uh, we, we need to make sure that we, we do them well, okay? Uh, we've got a couple pictures of control charts here to illustrate what we're talking about. But to begin with, okay, you absolutely have to have to make a plan. And there's a lot to that. You've got to decide what's important to measure because you're not going to chart everything. That would be silly. You need to decide what's important to measure. What are the important variables of your process? You have to have a set of representative samples, at least 25 of them. And these representative samples, uh, you then create, calculate the average and the range for the sample. You plot the averages. You see the upper chart on here? That is a range, that's, that's an average chart. It's actually individual values, but it could be averages of samples. And what you're seeing there is, the level, the value, as it goes up and down. But then you also want to plot, besides that, what you see at the bottom there, a range chart. Now, this happens to be a moving range chart, but it could be take a sample for each spot and then take what is the range of that sample. And, and so, you know, the range could not be less than zero, so it doesn't go below zero. So you plot that. And... You're, you need to evaluate, is this process stable or not? I mean, if it's showing big shifts back and forth, then you have other problems to deal with. But once your process is relatively stable, uh, then you can set control limits. And the control limits come from these numbers, from your data, your 25 samples. You calculate an upper control limit, see, UCL, 
and a lower control limit, or LCL. When, when you, you calculate these things, you put them on the chart, and then you lock them in place, and you keep adding more data. And there are rules that you will use in these charts to determine when it's time to adjust. If you don't break a rule, you don't adjust. When you do break a rule, when you do get something out of bounds, then you need to find and fix them, and then you make new plans. And so these are the general steps you need to go through. Um, if you have these steps in place, now we get into the, the fun part, okay? Common cause and exceptional cause. Uh, this is the key idea here, and it is not always known. Um, separating these two types of variation allows intelligent, efficient, and effective management. How many of you have known somebody who would who normally goes out and just manages a problem? They live with it. They just manage things because it's a problem. Or do you know anybody who tries to solve a situation that is, you know, baked in? They try to solve it? Look, you don't manage problems, you fix them. You don't solve situations, you manage them. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. Common cause variation is a situation. It is baked in. It is part of the normal process variation. And if, it, if that's all you've got, common cause variation, you need to leave it alone. Don't tamper. If you have exceptional causes, the rules in SPC will tell you you've got them. And this will tell you you have to intervene. You've got a problem to solve. These are calculated from relatively stable data, as we mentioned. If you have a totally uncontrolled process, it will be unstable. You have to put some common sense controls in place first. For example, get rid of incoming defects. If you've got defects entering your process, well, shame on you. That is going to create a mess with your process. Okay. Uh, and, and Mike asks the question, how do you know it's stable enough? Well, it looks good. There really isn't a rule for determining it's stable enough. And you can actually set control limits on somewhat unstable processes. And they will tell you when you've gone way beyond. And then you adjust those things and you become more and more stable. So it is, it's a it's a step-by-step -step thing as you're going through. What you're trying to do is to find signals, not noise. Most of your variation comes from noise. But a signal would be an actual process shift. Something has changed in your process. You need to investigate this and react before it gets out of hand. Uh, you need to have a good investigation process. Well, this means you have to have a team that can go out and investigate to understand what's actually happening. Just making these paper charts is not going to fix a problem. You have to have people who are funded, paid, and can go out and fix these things. You wanna make sure that you keep a human in the loop. You need to have a human watching the control charts, okay? And, and Adriana says, do you need to make sure it's a normal distribution? And the answer is no. You do not have to know that it's a normal distribution. And, and you know, Zach's asking, what about big data? Well, the nice thing about SPC is you don't have to use tons of data. You can take samples from your tons of data. And if you apply it wisely, we're going to talk about taking samples wisely. You, you can get control without drowning in data. So you're, remember, if you automate things, it's going to need maintenance. You can't just turn it on and let it go because things will change it. You need a human there watching it, kind of hand-holding your process. So Walter Schuhart talked about uh, uses. A report card is kept for the sake of keeping records. They're not used in real time, 
and you just kind of mark them down and put them in a file. This is a weak use of SPC. Uh, a second use would be per process adjustment. So this is where you've got a feedback loop, okay? And, and you look at the process and it goes out of whack, it fails a rule or two, and then you have to make a process adjustment. When used properly, this will result in more consistent operations. But of course, your people have to know how to adjust the process. They have to know where the knobs are to turn on the process to really get it back into, into control again. And that, that can take some, some effort. The third one is a process trial. Now, this is where you're analyzing data from a simple experiment. Sometimes this can be used as an alternative to analysis of variance and other statistical techniques. So th this is where you're going to learn something. You're, you're trying a change to see what happens. The fourth use would be extended monitoring used as a discovery method to see what are the best predictors of your performance. Usually you have a team and the team has a mission and you're attempting to improve the effectiveness or the efficiency of your process. This gives you good long-term benefit. This improves things in the long term. Okay. Um, continual improvement. Well, after you've done the extended monitoring and possible process trials, now you can look at continual improvement. How do you remove the exceptional events? How do you remove those things that come up every now and then and, and throw your system out of whack? Now, we also need to talk about some foundations. And, and at the top, we talk about Schuhart as one of our references. We're also referring to Don Wheeler, who is a current living expert in this. Okay, Don, Don is uh, one, of, one of the top guys in, in statistics. Um, again, Bob says, how robust is it against departure from normality? Okay, I can rely on Wheeler who has looked at this for decades. And Wheeler says, you don't care what the distribution is. That doesn't matter, it still works. So foundations, number one, use three sigma limits. Don't use two sigma limits. See, the three sigma are action limits. They're not probability limits, okay? There's an, there's an economical balance between too many false alarms and missing signals. They will always be based on your process data. Yes, even if it's not normally distributed. You cannot determine your sigma limits from specifications. Remember, specifications tell you how to treat the product, but they do not tell you how, when to take action on the process. Specs are on product. Sigma limits are on the process. And those are not the same thing. This is the problem when you try to do modified control limits, such as pre-control. Pre-control uses specifications. Again, the problem with that, those spec limits are insensitive to non-normal data. You will get in trouble with non-normal data if you try to use spec limits and pre-control. With 70 years of practice, we know that three sigma limits are effective. And the words of Don Wheeler, accept no substitutes, <laughs> okay? Number two, use a dispersion measure to set your limits. This introduced a lot of robustness in your tracking. The choice of a dispersion limit, the dispersion st statistic is really unimportant. You can use ranges, you can use standard deviation or a root mean square. That's the bottom chart, the dispersion measure because that tells you whether things are getting wilder on you in each set of samples. <clears throat> Number three, apply rational sampling and rational subgrouping. We're gonna talk about that again in a minute here. But what that really means is you have to collect your data appropriately. You got to choose your subgroups wisely. So I've got rules for that. Um, you wanna make sure that the sources of your variation that are present in your process will show up. <clears throat> so if you fail to do rational sampling and rational subgrouping, your charts will be worthless. Fourth, uh, you need to use what you learned from this thing. 
Uh, knowledge is only useless, useful as a guide for action. All right. So you have to trust the ability to, you're going to respond to the knowledge. Now, this may seem obvious. Okay. But we've got to remember Dr. Deming's 14 points. We know that old habits die hard. So there must be some kind of catalyst to promote organizational change and create new habits. If you have a response mechanism in place, your SPC will give you change. You will gain more knowledge. You'll be more effective. Remember that such a change makes demands upon the organization. Your budget needs to reflect the ability to make change happen. So you cannot lock down your budget so tight that, that you cannot fix things when they break. Just remember, Dr. Deming's 14 points are not a checklist. They're to be applied flexibly to create a new environment which is conducive to improvement. By the way, I got that from Dr. Deming's grandson. So um, let's go on here and talk about different kinds of data briefly. <clears throat> you got to pick the right control chart. Now, this looks confusing, perhaps, uh, and, and, but it's, it's really a very simple chart to use. You start at the top and you say, do I have attribute data? Do I have variable data? Now, Sandy and I have already talked about variable data and attribute data, so you should be familiar with what we mean by that. But attribute data is like defect or not defect, good or bad. And variable data is a measured value, a value on a scale. If you have attribute data, you're going to go on, on, the, on the blue side of this chart. And if you have variable data, you're going to go on the purple side of this chart. And you see it's pretty simple. I have pass-fail data. Uh, is it defects per item or is it defective items? Okay, if it's defective items, then what kind of subgroup do I want? Do I want constant? Do, do, are my subgroups always the same size? Or do they change every day? For instance, if I was looking at the number of defective checks issued from a, a payroll department, uh, that's going to be a variable number each day. My, my sample size, I won't issue the same number of paychecks every, every month. So that's going to be a variable sample size. So that would mean using a P chart. Okay, so we got that. If you're dealing with variable data, uh, you can use an IMR chart if your sample size is one. If, if your rational sample is each's, then that's your chart. If your rational sample is going to be two to five, then you're going to use an X bar R chart. And if your rational sample is 10 or more, then you're going to want to use a mean and standard deviation chart. We do not recommend the use of these special cases down at the bottom. Um, you know, they only apply in very limited places. And again, Wheeler is very dismissive of these things. So let's talk about that rational thing. What did I mean when I said that? Well, first of all, what do your values that you're measuring represent? What are these numbers? You need to ask these questions, these subgrouping principles, and I have six of them. Never knowingly subgroup unlike things together. And this should be obvious. Unlike things might be samples from two different machines. That, that's ridiculous. What's that gonna tell you? You need to minimize the variation within your subgroup sample. Uh, you, you, you need to make sure that the variation is not hidden inside the subgroup, because you see that then you're gonna average it, you're not gonna see that variation. You wanna maximize the chances for variation between subgroups. For example, if you had an injection molding machine and you were injection molding 40 parts at a time, every time the, the die closed, it would fill up 40 cavities and make 40 parts, okay? Each cavity is going to have a different characteristic. You wouldn't average all 40 of those parts together and you wouldn't randomly pick one of those portions off that die, okay? You'd be looking at one portion of the die, one, say, say a corner 
place in the die. And you'd be taking all the corner ones and you'd be taking three or four successive shots and that would be your subgroup because that same part of the die is going to perform in a consistent manner. So you've minimized the variation within the subgroup and then you're gonna have more variation outside of the subgroups. So you're averaging in your samples, you're averaging across noise, but you're not averaging across signals. Something in your process that is likely to shift and you should know what these things are. You should not sample so that these shifts are hidden by your sample size. That's what we mean by rational. It's really hard to put into words, you know? Uh, and and Abdullah Khan says, that depends on the cavity. Yes, it does. But it's also the heating of the dye and, and how the plastic flows into that portion of the cavity because the flow to get to that cavity is going to be different. You need to monitor what's going on in your process and keep a record of your subgrouping. If something in your process shifts and suddenly your changes are happening within your subgroups, it's time to change your rational subgrouping, all right? So number one, each subgroup must be logically homogeneous. Number two, the point of a subgroup is to establish a signal and to avoid noise. So choose your subgroups so that the variation within the subgroup is small. Principle number three says, if your knowledge of the process tells you that there are different factors affecting your results, then you should make sure that these factors appear in different subgroups, okay? Now you're gonna see signals from the different factors. Number four just says, Make sure that these averages inside your subgroups represent noise. So this, get, this hides the noise. You don't care about noise. Noise is not the problem. It's the signals that are the problems. And principle number five, you must understand the basics of your process. You have to know what's going on. This allows you to monitor the frequency, how often you do it and how often you make decisions and do you use them appropriately. If each individual item may vary significantly, then a subgroup of size one may be what you need. That does work. When you have limited amounts of data, like you say you're doing a trial run, okay? Uh, it's advisable to look at a running record of your individual values, the, the IMR chart, okay? Because you just have very limited data. Again, just automatically subgrouping when you have limited data is a bad idea. And principle number six, frequent changes in the operator's methods will destroy any validity in your SPC system. So your operators need to know how to sample and they need to know how to measure. That should go without saying. So we've, we've, we've worked our way through this rational thing. I'm gonna hand this off now to Sandy. Thank you, Doug. All right, now I'm going to start with um, a story because usually Doug and I kind of have, I haven't realized this, but have switched things up where I usually start the, the webinar and he usually finishes it. So this is a little weird for me because I like to tell my stories at at in the beginning, but we're, we're going to, um, since I'm doing the second half, I'm going to start with the story kind of in the middle, which is kind of weird. But I first wanted to to talk about kind of my history, my personal history with SPC, and then um, how I have actually used it, um, which is a kind of a very interesting application of it. Um, and hopefully you don't think it's too weird of an application because it's a personal one. Um, but I remember, <coughs> excuse me, I remember taking my first statistics course in college, Industrial Systems Engineering at The Ohio State. And I, I, uh, the statistics course was in a very large lecture hall with two or 300 people. And I usually sat kind of towards the top and it was like a completely new language. The first time you learn statistics, it is really a new language and it, it can be confusing. And the hard thing is that a lot of times the professors will be very theoretical 
and you really won't understand how it applies. So when I then took the, my statistical process control course, it was like a light bulb went, went off over my head. It was so exciting because it was, and again, I'm kind of geeky, but it was so neat to see an application and that it really helps you in the world. So it's basically taking, and we talked about the normal distribution stuff, and we can talk a little bit more about that because that is one kind of major misconception is, is most people think you do need to have a normal distribution. Um, and then, and Doug said, you don't always, and um, that is true. Um, the, some of these control charts actually use other distributions, especially the attribute ones, binomial, Poisson, and things like that. But, um, but the traditional um, X bar and R charts use the concept of a normal distribution. You've got your bell curve, and then you kind of think about turning that on its side and then tracking that distribution over time. And it might move up a little, might move down a little. If it's stable, it's staying between your, your um, upper and lower control limits. And I thought, wow, this is an application of statistics. I now understand the concept of a normal distribution in practice and how it applies to monitoring for defects. And it just, the whole world made sense to me and I just loved it. And that really started my interest in quality and I have continued it through Lean Six Sigma and through a lot of different applications of quality. So it's really cool. The other story I have to share is that I actually use this. I tracked when I was um, doing family planning, trying to get, get pregnant with my three wonderful children that I eventually had. Um, I used it to track my temperature. And, and it's supposed to track temperature for when you ovulate. And it really worked. I used my control chart and it actually your your temperature goes uh, out of control down uh, below the lower control limit and i was so excited that this was like wow again using my statistics and statistical process control i remember sh sharing it with my doctor and he kind of looks at it and he goes yeah you're ovulating and now you know he wasn't as excited about it as i was but anyway three kids later so there you go so um so it just shows how geeky I am that I'm actually sharing that story with all of you. But I am now going to go into the SPC rules. Oh, I do want to talk a little bit about, because um, we do want to answer that question about normal distributions. Um, the nice thing, and, and I didn't understand this the first time I took statistics at all. I really didn't understand it until I started teaching uh, these concepts, um, because you really got to know the material, right? And um, the our old central limit theorem really helps us um, get away without having to test or, or test for uh, that you for sure have a normal distribution because if you collect enough data and we do and because um, we've talked about um, Doug talked a little bit about you know the setting up of the control charts making sure you have enough data to start with knowing that you have a stable process that that concept of the central limit theorem even if we don't start with a a normal distribution if we collect enough data, and we always saw that 30 sample size, 30 subgroups, they say about 25 subgroups in X bar R charts, that it gets close enough to a normal distribution. That's what the central limit theorem helps us with. So that's why we say it doesn't always have to be a normal distribution to start off with. You can certainly test for it. You can certainly test to see if it's way far out. But a lot of times, and um, I think it was Zach asked about What's a real world application of, of statistical process control? The ones I've mostly used in industry have been in service type industries where we're tracking time, like length of stay, how long is a patient in the emergency department? Typically you will have multiple distributions that you're collecting that are embedded in that length of stay. You've got, and what I mean is you've got multiple processes going on. You've got the normal patients, who come in, aren't that sick, they get discharged. That's probably one process. Another process is uh, for patients that are much more uh, ill, more acutely ill, and they're probably gonna have a lot more tests and they're gonna probably get admitted to the hospital. And that's another distribution. Another one is we've got some patients that need to be transferred to another facility 
It takes a while to contact that facility, say a, a rehabilitation facility. Um, and it, we, sometimes they don't always have beds available. Sometimes we hold patients in the emergency department for observation. So that's a completely other distribution that if we munched all that together, we would not, um, we would not really be able to identify those signals for when one process goes out of control versus the other. Plus, we would have a very non-normal distribution of all those very long uh, length of stay. So we really have to understand our process before we start putting SPC in place. So that's the number one thing. Make sure you've mapped out your process with the process map. Make sure you have your subject matter experts. You really have to understand the process. So when you start collecting your data, you understand what the data is telling you. So once you've set up your control charts, you figured out your, your, your subgroup, your rational groupings. Now you start running them and you're always gonna kind of start piloting these, right? And this is part of what Doug talked about with the stability. Um, the traditional, your process is stable, is that there's no out of control points. Well, sometimes you can't get there right away because your process is not in control. And you really don't, um, you aren't able to get there until you start improving it. But you need to know what you need to improve. So we're gonna identify with our control charts running, we take initial, they always kind of call them pilot or initial control chart limits, our average and our upper and lower control limits. And of course, Minitab and any kind of statistical software can, can do that for you. And then we're gonna first see, and we can usually set these rules in the software as well. One caution, cautious, caution on this slide is that, um, You've got several different tests. I think Minitab is something like a dozen, but you don't want to use them all all the time. Really what these tests help you to do is to understand whether your process is showing random variation, the, the stable, the little things that happen that contribute to just that noise or if we have those signals where we're identifying special or assignable causes that something specific is happening to our process that we want to understand and we want to eliminate, identify the root cause of and eliminate that, that signal, that issue, that assignable cause. So we're really looking for patterns and these tests help us to figure out which, which of the tests identify patterns. The first one and the easiest and the, probably the most common is one point um, outside of our control limits. And um, the, what you can do is break these uh, control charts into zones, ABC zones of, of uh, percentages of um, the, the uh, one sigma, two sigma, three sigma, if you set them by the traditional three sigma limits. And if you have a point outside of the upper control limit or a point below the lower control limit, that's probably the most common sig signal that something's going on that you have to identify and find the root cause, fix it. Um, and then another one, and this is again, getting more into the patterns, nine points in a row in zone C or beyond. And so that just says that you have nine points that are going in the, in, the same, um, in the same area. And so something is happening. There's a pattern there. Something's happening to your process that is not, that goes beyond the probability that that should be occurring. And there's a whole lot of statistics behind this. And you can calculate those, the probabilities of those happening, but SPC and these tests do that for us. Test three, six points in a row steadily increasing or decreasing some type of run. Uh, a lot of times those types of things are tool wear in a manufacturing environment. Um, in, in my healthcare environment, it could be that um, we're starting to get a patient volume surge. So something's happening that can give us an early warning that maybe we have to get uh, some more uh, physicians or nurses um, involved. Um, and then 
the 14 points in a row alternating up and down, again, that's an indication that things are bouncing back and forth in some non-random way. And, um, and that is the probability of that occurring if nothing specific is happening is very low. So when it happens, it's not a good thing. So Doug, next one. Thank you. And we are gonna see some, some examples of these in a second. Um, two more rules. And again, um, the, um, when Schuhart wrote his book, and Deming talked a lot about this as well, that um, this two more rules when it becomes economically desirable, um, Schuhart really believed in implementing control charts from an economic perspective to be efficient from a, from a, a sampling, especially back then when we, it wasn't easy to sample. It was easy to sample five at a time and do the math without having to, to use a slide rule in that day. Uh, so, so that's why uh, some of these um, the subgroup sample sizes uh, came about. But um, he was very much about um, doing economical sampling and not trying to sample every single part going across the line. Now, there were a couple questions related to um, whether you should do 100% control. We can talk a little bit more about those. But I sense with 100% control, um, I think somebody mentioned um, if you have a safety characteristic or if um, you're looking at um, control, that's really kind of you're looking at specifications and acceptance sampling, which is not the same thing as what SPC does. Remember, SPC is controlling all the factors in your process or is assessing whether those factors are controlled. It's not, I mean, it is looking at a quality characteristic, but not for the reason of am I in, in within specification, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then, um, so these last two are two out of three points in a row in zone A or beyond, and four out of five in a row in, C, row in zone B or beyond. Just some, some other um, non, uh, kind of patterns that shouldn't be there. Next. Okay, so rule one is the, you've got the red circled items. Remember, um, this is an individual control chart and a moving range. So this was actually one item at a time taken. A lot of times this is, is um, if you have, uh, say, a batch of, um, like I've used this for payroll processing. You, you monitor um, the time it takes to run payroll each month. So you only have one batch or each every two weeks. You only have one batch every so often. So that's when you'd use an individual and a moving range control chart. So it gives you, again, the average, but it also gives you some measure of the variation, how much the average is moving across time, how much it is varying across time. And you can see on the, the moving range chart, there are a lot more points outside the upper control limit. So that's kind of the first thing you'll see next. The next one, having nine points in a row in zone C or beyond. And so you've got these, these um, uh, points there identified in red, and they're all kind of clustered together. And so this ordinarily, if you don't see patterns in a control chart, things are going up and down pretty uh, evenly, um, not explicitly up down because that's also another um, rule that you look at, if it just keeps going up and down, you've probably got a, a combination of a couple different processes within what you're tracking. But that's an unnatural thing. The probability of that occurring without some assignable cause is very low. So that's identified as a, a rule that you want to look at. Next one, please. Okay, uh, six points in a row, steadily increasing or decreasing. Again, this was the one I, I told you about in manufacturing environment. A lot of times that's tool wear. Um, a lot of times those individual um, points outside and upper and lower control limits can be like a change of material, change of suppliers, those types of things happening. And then also, if, you're, if you are tracking control charts across different shifts, that's probably a no-no as well. You want to keep control charts uh, separate because things change um, across shifts. You always hear, you know, things are more relaxed in the evening 
And so processes are different. People can be trained differently. Um, you can be running different um, numbers of processes, maybe different types of parts. And so you really want to be careful that you don't combine multiple processes and those factors in the same control chart. Next one. Uh, this one, not, uh, whoops, 14 points in a row, a row. I, yeah, this one's good, Doug, row, row four. 14 points in a row alternating up and down. Again, this, the probability that statistically that this would happen is very low. So we, we uh, identify if something assignable wasn't happening. So then we want to assign the cause. Why is this happening? Why is it alternating up and down um, in a, in a, just a, a pattern that isn't normal? Okay, next one. Um, and so this, according to the Lloyd S. Nelson rules, um, there's two more rules is diagnostic tests in setting up a control chart and, and checking subgroup rationality. And the one is uh, 15 points in a row in zone C above and below center lines, or eight points in a row on both sides of the center line with none in zone C. And again, the, um, all of these, um, most all of these can be selected in your um, statistical software. The major caution about these, especially as you're running control charts after you've set up the initial control limits and you've removed those initial assignable causes and then, and then you recompute your control limits and then you start using them, that you're, you're selecting just a few of these. Um, a lot of times you just select when points go outside of the control limits. Um, and if anything, you just maybe those first four that we saw. And so what we're really trying to identify are patterns. Okay, thank you. Next one. Uh, the next one is automation. So now that we can collect a lot of data, people probably think in the modern world, SPC has seen its day. And that's absolutely not true. Now you can collect a lot of data, but that doesn't mean that you should be using all of that data or that it is economically feasible to be throwing all that data into your control charts, even if it's um, automated process control. Um, even, even those programs should be selecting samples. So just because you have the data and you can doesn't mean that you should. So you really wanna have a strategy. Now, what might be nice is that you can uh, collect data and have uh, a few more quality char characteristics tracked than you might have. However, um, you just want to really be careful because you always want to have that person there that understands the process, understands what is important to measure those quality characteristics, and then is identifying the root causes. And no matter how much chat bots and uh, automation and all that kind of stuff, unless something is completely and utterly automated from, from the, the processes at the supplier all the way through receiving to moving things onto the shop floor, putting them through every single machine, and there's absolutely no hands-on, maybe until that happens, that... Um, you might be able to automate all of the SPC, but you st I believe you're, you're never going to get to that point. You still need those subject matter experts that understand the process and can search for those root causes when something is identified as out of control. Um, some of the decisions you want to make as you're looking at your uh, software is to really think about the depth of the providers from the understanding of their understanding of statistics. Um, the nice thing about Minitab is Minitab was originally developed by some um, professors at one of the universities. I think, is it NC State? I'm not sure exactly where it was. Um, I think it was. But, um, and so that's one thing that they had over and probably why they have been so successful in the market is they knew the statistics and you could trust and you could look in their help to understand what the statistics uh, were behind all of their 
um, analysis. So that's one thing that's really important. You don't want someone fly by night that doesn't have the sound basis in statistics. You want to be able to trust that they've calculated the control limits properly, that they've identified the rules properly, they're calculating the probabilities properly, and they're giving you the right advice from these, uh, from, from your, um, from your uh, control charts. Also, uh, from a flexibility and scalability, you know, is it, is it going to help with, um, help you with just a few control charts? Is it going to be something where you're going to be using a lot more control charts across a, a wider scope of quality characteristics? You want to think about that. You want to think about how they validated, how they help train, and then the maintenance of your, um, your control charts is really important because you don't want to just put a control chart in and then leave it forever. One, that there kind of gets to be that fatigue where people just aren't really tracking it and don't think it's all that important. But it's really important to understand and to maybe move something else when a process is, is very stable and in control and focus on something else so you can look at another qual quality characteristic, another process, um, and uh, move that expertise for SPC uh, around your organization and look at other things. All right. And then uh, this was something that um, someone asked for and we we're going to get to is um, the last topic here is uh, ways to fail. Um, so there's a lot in statistics and you'll see in any discussion on statistical process control, do not confuse specifications as control limits, totally different things. And specifications are are defined hopefully by customer requirements and they are tolerances put on a single part, a single, a single unit. They are not designed for taking a subgroup and averaging and using those specifications as control limits. Control limits and specifications are completely different things, but that is one thing that people will do is they'll plop their specifications on top of a control chart and think that that's giving them some valid information. Specifications are used for process capability studies. Control charts are used in a process capability study to identify and show that your process is stable so that you know that the process capability indices that we're calculating represent a stable process that's in control. Um, if not, you want to get that in control first before you do a process capability study. Then you use your specification limits. Two different things. People might get confused because you first start with control limits to identify stability. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so that, that does that. I didn't, I just noticed the time. We're kind of going quickly. Uh, measuring the wrong things and sticking to them. We talked a little bit about this. Um, well, first of all, you don't you really want to have the subject matter experts in the process. You really want to think through what are your critical to quality characteristics and measure those. And then you shouldn't stick to even a good thing. Um, you should, should um, if they're a stable process over time, maybe move to something else. Measurement issues, this is a given. You should have done a measurement systems analysis to start with, making sure that your measurement system is accurate because the, this same data is used in your control charts. And if it doesn't come from a accurate measurement system, you really aren't, um, that you're, you're using wrong data. Um, not using software correctly. Um, the one thing about Minitab is every time you put these, the data into your control charts, it, into the software, it's gonna recalculate your control limits. Typically, you wanna only recalculate your control limits after um, periodically, you know, um, just just after perhaps you've improved your process and it's and your control limits have shifted, then you would want to recalculate them, but not every time you throw your data into Minitab. But it'll do it for you, and that's sometimes what happens. Using the wrong SPC charts, there was a question earlier about somebody saying, if I'm looking at failure data and I've got percent of failures or I've got individual values, um, which one should I use? And it's it really uh, depends upon how are you collecting that data. What's easiest uh, the easiest way to collect it? 
you could use C or U charts, or you could use P or NP charts. Um, I would try both, and some of it is they really are giving you the same information. Some of it is whether you have um, kind of lots of defects um, and different types of defe defects that you're combining. Um, and then the other th element is um, um, yeah, um, kind of what speaks to people. How do people do people think of I'm 95% error free or am I I've got five defects. So some of it is how people are going to think of it and what's going to speak to them. And then you really need to identify those root causes. And if you don't follow through all the way to the end and, and assign causes to those assignable causes, then um, then you're really defeating the whole purpose. So, in conclusion, uh, make sure you do follow a step by step plan, really know your process, really understand what SBC is telling you. You need to have somebody who understands um, kind of the, the logic and the, the um, theory behind it and why it works, but then also really have the knowledge of the process. So, you really want to leverage operators, they have the most knowledge of that process. If you have an SPC team, an improvement team without those operators, you're not really going to get all the root causes and all the information that you need. Be careful about automation. It's not an end all be all. You could still use successfully use sampling. That's what SPC is for. And that's what you don't have to use every single data point. You can still sample. There's still value in the statistics and the sampling. Um, automate after testing and then revisit and review what you've learned and uh, change things up every once in a while. There's all our references. Thank you. And I did look through a lot of the questions and kind of tried to answer those in mine. Um, let me just look at a few other questions. I saw I talked about an example. Um, we talked about the failure statistics and kind of what chart we talked about normality. That was a, that were a lot of questions there. Um, common mistakes we talked about. I think we really got to most of these questions through our discussion. Doug, what did you think as you looked through those? I, I, I answered a couple as well. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously, uh, you know, SBC is a two day course if you want to learn all about it. And we just gave you a one hour <laughs> rush through this thing. Uh, but, but, you know, a video like this might be helpful if you're trying to get people on board where you work. Um, there, there were, you know, several questions that came up there. We want to make sure that you know about our series here. And I think at this point, Shoba, uh, you're going to take over, right? Right, so um, I am not taking questions for it's VR 659 and you both are right that most of the questions were answered. So I'll quickly go into the concluding uh, slides. I'm going to stop recording right now. Oh, and I would say please um, email Doug first if you want the the slides because he's always on top of his email, whereas I'm not. Yeah. <laughs>